Shanna Miller remains the most decorated American gymnast, male or female, in history. She is the only American to rank among the top 10 all-time gymnasts and is the only female athlete to be inducted into the U.S. Olympics Hall of Fame twice. As an individual in 2006, and as part of the Magnificent Seven in 2008. Shannon's tally of five medals, two silver, three bronze at the 92 Olympics was the most medals won by a U.S. athlete. At the 1996 Olympic Games, she led the Magnificent Seven to the U.S. women's first ever team gold. For the first time in history of, for any American gymnast, she captured gold on the balance beam. Recently, Shannon launched her company, Shannon Miller Lifestyle Health and Fitness for Women, to empower women to make their health a priority. In January of 2011, Shannon was diagnosed with a malignant germ cell tumor, a form of ovarian cancer. She had the baseball-sized tumor removed successfully and followed up with nine weeks of chemotherapy for this rare germ cell malignancy. Shannon is currently cancer-free and continues to be a strong advocate for early detection. Shannon is a television host, radio host, and was most recently in London as an analyst with Yahoo Sports for this past summer's Olympics. Ladies and gentlemen, Shannon Miller. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna try to attempt to lower this just a little bit, if that's okay. Oh, here we go. Good thing, because I'll break it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a little bit shorter than everyone in the room. Um, well, uh, geez, the summer of 96, and I was, uh, I was saying earlier that it's nice to be able to talk in a room where at least most of you were born in 1996, um, tend to forget how long it's been, but um, it was just an absolutely incredible year um, for me, for my team, the Magnificent Seven, um, as we would come to be known. I remember walking into the Georgia Dome, 40,000 screaming people, uh, flashbulbs popping, and, um, and just a sense that this was our night. This was our time. We had bronze in 92. We were going to go home with nothing less than gold at these games. And by the end of the competition, we proudly stood atop that gold medal platform as a team with the first ever women's gymnastics gold medal. And it was Absolutely spectacular. <laughs> um, yes, thank you. Um, it, was, it was magical. It was an absolutely magical evening. And, and for all the athletes in the room, you know how hard you work day in and day out. And to finally get to the culmination of your career and to be able to grasp that gold, it is just, um, it, it's an amazing feeling. And to be able to, to see your flag being raised and hear the sound of your national anthem and know that you, you took part in that. Um, it, was, it was just incredible. And um, several days later, I found myself uh, going into the balance beam event final. Uh, it's one of those things after the team, uh, after the team event, you kind of have to wake yourself up and pin yourself, and you go, okay, wait a second, it's not over yet. <laughs> and sometimes your coach has to remind you of that. Uh, I had still had three more competitions to go. And it had not gone particularly well. It was a bit of a roller coaster. I started out on this high with this team gold medal. Then I went into the all-around final. And I had a good competition, but I stumbled a little bit on the floor exercise. Didn't finish exactly where I would have liked. Went into the vault final and performed a vault that I never missed in practice. I mean, never missed this vault once in practice and fell splat right on my rear in front of millions of people um, at the Olympic Games. So I was devastated. And here I was looking at my last event final, my last 90 seconds of my entire Olympic career, balance beam, the most feared event in all of gymnastics, four inches wide, 16 feet long. And how in the world was I going to stay on this thing? I fall off of it all the time. <laughs> so it was that night just getting up the courage, telling myself, okay, you've trained, you've done the work, you've gone through the blood, sweat, and tears. And, and then as I walked up to the podium and saluted the judge, I held my hands over the beam, just a couple extra beats that night, and I thought about something my mom had said. She said, Shannon, you've, you've done all the work. You've gone through the repetition. This is your time. You, you need to enjoy this. There are a million little girls out there that would do anything to fall off the beam at an Olympic Games. Go out there and enjoy it. 
And I think for the first time in my career, you know, we were always taught block out the crowd. You focus, you put those blinders on, nothing else exists except you and that beam. And, and this was the first time in my career that I really allowed the audience in. Um, I remember there was a guy up in the left hand of the stands and it was just, you could hear a pin drop. It was so quiet, the arena, and this guy yells out, hey, shut your flash off. And, you know, here I'm thinking, oh, isn't that sweet? He, you know, he wants to make sure everyone has their cameras off and, and all of that. And then it was this instant, wait, why are you thinking about this? Think about your next move. And um, so all those things were going on, but it was that moment in time where you realize that this is so much bigger than just you. And it's just a part of life that you need to enjoy whatever happens because you've done all the work up into that point. So you give 100%. Um, no one can ask more of you, and you can't ask any more of yourself. So I kind of went through the routine, skill after skill. I gained a little bit more confidence with each skill that I hit. And finally, I was at the end of the beam, arms raised, ready for the dismount, just saying a little prayer, <laughs> please, God, just let me land on my feet tonight. <laughs> and um, I hurtled toward the end of the beam, one twist, two flips later, when I felt my feet hit the floor, and I realized I was standing up. It was <laughs> the most amazing feeling ever, you know, this mix of um, joy and excitement and relief, and I think I saluted the judge, but who the heck knows at that point. I saw my coach jumping up and down on the sidelines, and um, I didn't know what the score was. To this day, I'm not really sure what the score was. I didn't know if there was a medal, what color it might be, but what I knew was I had just performed about the best routine that I could have under the circumstances, and I was pretty happy with that. That moment, that gold medal routine was 15 years in the making, and I can still remember that feeling when I closed my eyes. I know exactly how it felt when my feet hit the floor. It was a time that is ingrained in me. It's something I'll never, ever forget. And of course, watching our girls this past summer at the Olympics, it brought it all back as if it was yesterday. And um, well, I don't know if any of you guys watched the summer, <laughs> the summer games last year. Yeah, London Olympics, girls did pretty well. <laughs> and it was exciting, but I have to admit that I'm very excited that I'm sitting in a nice cushy chair in the announcer's booth and not down on the floor. Um, my leotard wearing days are over and these girls are absolutely incredible with the skills that they do. It is, um, I think every four years we think, how much more difficult can it get? How many twists can you add? How many flips can you add? And every four years, they blow us away. So um, that was really exciting. And of course, now that I'm on the broadcasting side, I'm asking those pro girls all the same questions that I was asked <laughs> for years on end. And of course, the number one question that is asked is, what was your favorite Olympic moment? And that's a really difficult question to answer because um, there's so many great moments. I mean, just being at the Olympics, walking into the Olympic Village, standing on the podium, that first time you go out there and, and you hit a routine and you're at the Olympics, it's, it's all wonderful. Um, there are so many of those moments. But for me, I think, um, you know, two obviously stand out, certainly the team gold medal and capping off my career with balance beam gold uh, was spectacular. I just, I couldn't dream of anything more. But when I look back at my career, it's, it's really the journey that stands out. Um, you know, the, the release move on bars that I worked before, you know, for eight months before I finally, finally grasped the bar and that feeling when I finally did it right. Um, traveling around the world with my coaches and my teammates, watching the American flag being raised the first time I won an international competition. There's just nothing like those moments. The gold medal moment from 96, yes, it was 15 years in the making. And, and after that, I retired. I went back to school. I had started my undergrad work um, part-time while I was getting ready for the games and then went back and finished um, afterwards. I went on to law school at Boston College thinking, well, I just kind of need to know <laughs> what I don't know uh, before I go trying to start a foundation or start a company, and I really need to know that just for myself. And of course, exams and papers, those are um, a different kind of work, but the lessons I learned through sport helped carry me through um, the same obstacles and battles that 
and that I faced in sport. And I think for, for most of us, what we do every day, whether it's in sports, whether it's in our family life, whether it's in work life, um, it's all about setting and achieving goals. And that's something that you all have learned from the first day you started in athletics. It's all about goal setting. It's trying to achieve that next, that next move. And um, my coach used to set us down at the beginning of the year. And this started when I was eight years old. And he'd pass out these index cards and he'd say, okay, well, you know, write down your, your big goal. You know, what's your dream? What do you want to do and, uh, in gymnastics? And of course, I'd write down, well, I really, I really want to compete at the state competition. And eventually that became, you know, I want to compete at the Olympic Games. And then it wasn't quite that easy. He made us turn over the index card and we had to painstakingly write down all the things that we had to do each day in order to get to that long-term goal. So if I wanted to compete in the state competition, I had to learn a new dismount off of uneven bars. I had to get my legs straight on the balance beam. I had to um, work on my dance on the floor. What were those things that I could get up every single day and think, this is what I have to do today so that in 10 years, 15 years, I can achieve my goal. And that breaks it down into smaller bites that you can handle, helps you stay motivated on a daily basis. Whether it was learning a new dismount, acing an exam, I needed to focus on those short-term goals um, so that I could ultimately reach that long-term goal. Uh, gold medal at the Olympics, walking across the stage on graduation day. Whatever those were, I had to stick to those small-term goals. And I think back to that time and I wonder <laughs> how in the world I made it through some of, some of those workouts. Um, seven hours a day, six days a week, years on end. But I know it was because of the plan. It was because of those goals that I had set in place that I was able to get up those Saturday mornings and go to a six-hour workout while my sister and brother sat in the living room in their jammies watching cartoons. <laughs> and that can be a, a tough road. But you get that index card out and you read it and you think, you know, there's somebody out there that's going in for a Saturday morning workout. Might be one of the Russians, might be Dominique Dawes or Kim Zmeskel. It's someone's in there working out, and I've got to get in there and do the same work. So after graduating, I um, set out to start my foundation, which is dedicated to fighting childhood obesity, and, and also my company, which is really focused on um, helping women make their health a priority. And in late 2009, I added another role, mom, um, my favorite role, probably the most difficult role, but my favorite. And I found these new passions after gymnastics, and I think that's really hard once you kind of leave your sport. It's when you retire at 19, what do you, what do, you do with the rest of your life? And you have all those questions, and now I felt like I kind of found my next passions. Um, I wanted to focus on the issues that, that really affect us all, whether it's you know, weight gain or time management, the ups and downs of just being a busy woman and trying to um, take care of your family while handling your own health and making sure that we don't always sit on the sidelines of our own health, that we get out there and we do something about it. I wanted women to make their health a priority and not feel guilty about doing so. Because I think a lot of women, um, especially once you start having families, it's all about, you know, you get your kids to the doctors, you nag your husband endlessly, and you set the appointment, and you drive them there if you have to. But, but then when it comes to you, uh, you know, I don't really have time to go to the doctor today. I've got work. I've got this. I've got that. We find excuses to not take care of ourselves. And I think a lot of that comes from maybe, maybe a little bit of guilt of, well, if I'm taking care of myself, I'm not taking care of someone else. And so I want to help women understand that um, taking care of their own health is not a selfish act. It's a very selfless act because, frankly, if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't be there for everyone else. So things were going really good. My husband and I were enjoying this um, little boy, our, our little ball of joy, Rocco. And my company was going strong. Foundation was growing. I felt like I kind of hit my stride. I'd uh, found my calling. All was right in my world. <laughs> and... Uh, and I felt like, you know, I, I kind of tried to take care of myself through the years, you know, in sport, um, health, and nutrition, and, and physical activity. Those were all things we focused on. And then after, it kind of carried over into the rest of my life. My, um, my diet and exercise philosophy is one of everything in moderation. 
I like my chocolate, <laughs> I like my latte, but I try not to go you know, too crazy in, in any one thing. Um, I like to be active, but I don't know who has time, you know, once, once you're in the real world and the jobs and everything else, you don't get to train like you do as a, a pure athlete. I couldn't train seven hours a day anymore. I couldn't go work out even for two hours. So you have to find a moderation in your uh, physical activity as well. You have to have, find something that um, works with your lifestyle. And I felt like, you know, kind of like work and family, I kind of hit my stride with, with health and wellness. I was kind of maintaining and, and doing a good job of you know, being healthy, but just kind of taking that everything in moderation and, uh, approach. Little did I know at the time that those passions for um, health and wellness family, my competitive background, all the things that I had been involved in up to that point would ultimately save my life. It was uh, December of 2010. We had just launched my company in July of 2010. So come December, you know, we're almost six months in, and we have all these program launches. Things are going crazy. It's the holidays, and of course, with all of us, um, you know, there's not time to do anything. And I had my doctor's appointment that I had scheduled, and I called up, I found out I was gonna be out of town, had to travel on the day to my doctor's appointment. So I called up fully expecting, uh, and, and I hate to say this, hate to admit it, but fully expecting to cancel my exam and just put it off till next year. You know, hey, it's, I feel great, it's fine. I've got all these things in January, a little bit in February, maybe March, April, I'll get, get around to it. And um, while I was on the phone with the receptionist, I started feeling a little bit guilty. <laughs> and, and maybe it was all the women, um, the physicians, the nurses I had just finished interviewing during Breast Cancer Awareness Month in October um, that had said, you know, don't skip your exams. Early detection can save your life. And um, maybe it was the fact that my mom is a cancer survivor uh, diagnosed in 2008. Or just maybe that, that angel that, uh, that tries to steer you in the right direction. And, and most likely... Um, a fair amount of guilt for being an advocate for women's health and even considering skipping my own exam. So when the receptionist came back on the line, I said, you know what, I, I'm not going to cancel. Just what's your first available? And I'll just come in. I said, well, um, actually, we had an opening this morning. <laughs> Great. Okay. I'll be over. <laughs> be over in 15 minutes. So I drove on over there, uh, not thinking about whether or not I was healthy. It was more like, okay, can I squeeze this in before I've got to get to my next meeting? Not even considering cancer, and cancer wasn't on my radar. Um, I think even when you have a loved one, a, a friend that goes through a cancer diagnosis, there's just still something there that says, well, it, it's not going to happen to me, you know, because... I'm not old, or I'm not this, or I'm not that. There's a, a million different reasons why it's never going to happen to us. So that morning, uh, I went in for my visit in the span of, I'd say, about 15 minutes with, this, um, with my doctor. I got the shock of my life. I had um, a 7-centimeter cyst on my left ovary, which um, they told me it was kind of about a baseball. Uh, and my first thought was, what? <laughs> how, do you, how do you have something like that and not know about it? And I really did not think that I had any kind of symptoms. I felt fine. I was active as always. And I'll never forget that morning, just driving home, um, calling my husband, all of the things that were going on in my head. Um, and I kept thinking, you know, it's nothing. Hey, doctor said, cysts come and go in women all the time. It's probably going to go away on its own. You know, no problem. And then, and then the other part of my brain said, wait, did he indicate that this could be cancer? No. No, I mean, that couldn't be right. And my brain had kind of shut off a little bit after I heard the word cyst. So I was a little bit foggy on everything he said after that. So what seemed like this, you know, typical appointment had snowballed into blood tests and exams and ultrasounds and you name it, I had it. And um, by early January, I was sitting in an oncologist's office um, hearing words that you never want to hear, like mass and uh, malignancy and cancer. 
And that was, um, I, well, I mean, it stopped my world. <laughs> everything that I thought was so important, everything that I thought, um, you know, when I got up in the morning, I have to do this, I have to do these 50 things, didn't even matter. Um, I just had to get this taken care of. And January 13th, I was in surgery to have the tumor removed along with my left ovary. And I think one of the most difficult parts of, of the journey was going into surgery and kind of not knowing what they were going to uh, find. We didn't know if it was benign or malignant at the time. Um, so it was, we, we don't really know what you're going to come out of surgery with. We don't know if it's going to be benign and it's all good or it could be malignant, but maybe it's contained and, and, and that's good too. But what if it had spread? What if he had to do a hysterectomy? Would I ever have more children? I mean, there are all these questions that are going on in your brain that you don't typically think about, you know, when you're in your early 30s. But I realized it was just kind of out of my hands. I couldn't control any of it. Just, you know, <laughs> do a fair amount of praying and, and, uh, and hope for the best. And after the surgery, we, um, we had great news. Uh, they caught it very early. Yes, it was malignant. A uh, germ cell tumor, which is a form of ovarian cancer, but um, this type actually targets women in their, er in their late teens and early 20s. So it's something that we all have to be aware of and, and, and really take care of our bodies and listen to our bodies and get in for those exams. But um, that's another discussion. <laughs> um, for me, it was relief. And my husband, I could see on his face this great amount of relief and, and the idea that, okay, we're done. Yeah, it was a, a, a pretty rough surgery. I had eight weeks of recovery. I couldn't lift my son. He's 15 months old at the time. But I can deal with that. That is fine. Um, it was good news all around. And, and for two weeks, we rode this high of, okay, we're just on the, on the track to recovery and, and all is good. And then we kind of got the second blow of that, that one-two punch. My um, oncologist called one night, about two weeks later, and um, said, well, uh, he left me a voicemail. I kind of need your husband and you to, to meet me in my office tomorrow morning. Like, it's never good when your oncologist calls you in the evening <laughs> and asks you something like that. So um, we're very lucky. We have a, a wonderful, wonderful man who um, is my oncologist, and, and he actually got on the phone with us that night because we both were like, oh, we're not going to be able to sleep, so just, just tell us over the phone. It's fine. And... Um, he let us know that the pathology reports had come back. It was a higher grade malignancy than they originally felt, and, and now they really thought that the best chance of non-reoccurrence was uh, nine weeks of a pretty aggressive chemotherapy regimen. It's like, great. <laughs> and I think up until that point, um, I really had not thought of it as cancer. Because by the time I knew it was cancer, it was gone. So it was more about recovery. And now with chemo, it was the first time I realized like, kind of what I was dealing with. And surgery is, is not fun. It was, um, I lost 10% of my body weight overnight, which, you know, hey, for us girls, it's, you know, it's not always a bad thing, but you don't really want to lose it overnight, <laughs> and not in this way. Um, so that was hard. I was very weak. I wasn't allowed to lift my son, which is hard for a new mom. He wasn't even walking yet. Yes, I know, 15 months old, he wasn't walking. But um, <laughs> he learned quickly after that. Um, there's the six-inch scar that reminds me every single day that I am not as invincible as I once thought that I was. But, you know, with surgery, you really couldn't control any of it. I mean, the tests were going to detect whatever they detect, and the surgeon was going to do what he was going to do. Is not like I was going to be able to help him out a whole lot there. But this conversation about chemotherapy, it was a game changer. Um, I'm a pretty forward thinker, and um, I try not to dwell on the negative. I learned that in gymnastics. You fall off the beam, you get back up, you minimize your deductions, and you keep moving forward. You don't have time to look back. You don't have time to dwell on the negative of, um, of something, some mistake that you made. So I'm thinking forward motion. Okay, we're going to take this on. And I thought, well, chemotherapy, I mean, that's actually something that I could actively participate in, um, in my own health. I could get strong. I could um, focus on nutrition and really take on this battle. And uh, like in gymnastics, I think um, gymnastics is unlike some sports where um, you're really racing against another competitor. It's not track where um, you know, you're really 
up there against someone else. And, and even then, you're kind of racing for time. But um, for us... I can't affect anyone else and what they're doing in the competition. All I can affect is me. So I go out there and I try to get a, you know, a 10-0 on, on every event every single time, and that's my goal. I don't really worry about anything anyone else is doing. So I win or lose the competition based on my own terms. And so my goal with every competition was to prepare and to compete to the best of my abilities, to absolutely participate as fully as I could. And I began to see cancer as my competitor. Um, not the type of competitor that uh, you race to the finish line. This is the type of competitor that you out-train, you out-maneuver. Uh, many times you win the competition before you even step on the floor. You prepare, you dig in, and you do the work every single day. And here was chemotherapy. Here was a tool that I could use as part of the strategy and um, preparation was going to be key. So I had four weeks by the, you know, before I had to start chemo, and I gained back some of my weight, and I started walking and swimming, two of the best activities for anyone, and they were things that I could do after the surgery. Um, I started eating <laughs> more. <laughs> um, my diet became focused on calorie consumption, which was, you know, if you're going to look for a silver lining in the whole thing, I kind of got a license to eat anything and everything I wanted. So that was kind of cool. I was at, um, do you have five guys up here? Yeah. I was there about every day. <laughs> and I did not turn down the french fries. Um, surgery had limited me. Chemotherapy would limit me. And I have a feeling many of you are like me and that you don't deal well with limits. We like to break limits. We like to break down barriers. We like to go forward and move through. And diet and exercise allowed me to focus on the areas where I could be active in creating the best possible starting point for chemotherapy. I knew that um, the healthier I went into treatment, uh, the easier and faster recovery would be, and the less chance I would meet mistreatment days, which meant a better prognosis in the end. Cancer is a game changer. It focuses you like never before. I thought I was focused for the Olympic Games. <laughs> I never even understood what true focus was until I was hit with the big C word. Right now, my main goal was to live. And it was all about everything that I had to do each day to make sure that that happened. I look back at those days growing up in Oklahoma, uh, following my older sister into the sport of gymnastics at the age of five. And, uh, I was one of those kids, I never watched gymnastics growing up. I was too busy tearing up my parents' furniture for that. Um, so I, you know, the only thing I wanted in the world, I wanted to be like my big sis. And if she was going to do gymnastics, well, then so was I. But here I was. I was this incredibly shy, tiny, knob kneed little girl with big, frizzy, curly hair. I, I didn't have the legs of a Mary Lou Retton, the powerhouse. I didn't have the, the grace of a Nadia Comaneci. I went from recreational gymnast to competitive athlete through endless hours of training, um, pulled muscles, but most of all, this never quit attitude. If you told me oh, sweetie, you know, you, you can't do that. You're not strong enough. Well, I would show you that, yes, I can. I will make it happen one way or another. That was just my attitude going in. The desire to win uh, on a daily basis was what kind of fueled me um, throughout the years. You know, could I stick 10 landings today? Could I uh, make it through a floor routine without a fall? Uh, what were those things I could do um, those goals that I could set, and I loved accomplishing my tasks and kind of checking them off my list. So for most of my career, um, I was not the most talented athlete <laughs> in my gym, um, really anywhere. In fact, for the first several years of my competitive career, I'm not really sure I stayed on the balance beam at all. It took me longer than other girls to learn some of the foundational skills that I needed in order to progress to the next step. And at times, it seems like I spent my entire career coming back from defeat. Um, but those challenges, they gave me this dogged determination um, and instilled a work ethic in me that rivaled many of um, 
that of many of the seasoned athletes. I just would not give up. While competing at my um, Olympic qualifier in 1996, here I was coming up on my second Olympic Games, and, and the idea of competing on home soil in Atlanta, I mean, that was just too good to pass up. And I went into the Olympic qualifier feeling prepared, went up on my first event, the balance beam, and I fell. First event, last chance to make the Olympic team. This was going to be it for my career. You know, I knew this. You know, doing two Olympics was a big deal for a gymnast at the time. And, and really, at the time, there was no thought of hanging around for a third. So the saying was in gymnastics, you can't fall and win. And coaches and parents and officials, everyone repeated this nonstop. You can't fall and win. Don't fall. But what I had learned from my career <laughs> was that when you fall, you get back up. And you do the best you can to minimize those deductions, to keep moving forward, because you never know what's going to happen. No matter what, you just keep going. I went on to perform some of the best routines of my life on the next three events. And by the end of the night, I very proudly stood atop that first place podium. I secured my spot on my second Olympic team, and I think I proved to many that sometimes you can fall and win. And sometimes um, that's the only way you do win, and that's life. You make a mistake, you face an obstacle, you fall down. Well, you pick yourself back up, you put one foot in front of the other, and you keep going. You never give up. And I think it's really important, and I talk a lot about this um, when I talk to um, those going through a cancer diagnosis. It's really important, no matter what the challenge is in your life, that you have those real emotions. And I'm a pretty positive person. I smile a lot. I, I enjoy life. But there are those real moments that you have to have. Those, you know, that moment where you just have to have that pity party for yourself and you want to pull the covers over your head and you want to cry and you want to yell and you want to ask why. Why now? Why me? And all of those things. And that's okay. You have to have those moments. Allow yourself to do that. But when you've got it out of your system, you pull up, pull up the covers, you stand up, and you keep moving forward. You keep moving forward no matter what. I believe that we truly do learn more from our challenges and our mistakes than from our successes. Um, I think falling down didn't rattle me as much as some of the other athletes because, frankly, I was so used to it. I fell a lot <laughs> during my career. And I was also used to picking myself up and moving on, putting the past behind me. Um, that was probably one of the best lessons that I learned through sport. When you're facing a challenge, and cancer is often the ultimate challenge, you must pick yourself up and you must keep moving forward. When I would look at myself in the mirror and barely recognize that person looking back because I had no hair and I had no eyebrows or eyelashes and my skin was pale, um, I had to remember that losing my hair was not a symbol of my sickness. It was a symbol that I was doing everything that I could to get and remain healthy. That's how we have to turn things around in our mind. We have to look at the positive. We have to look at, um, at all of these challenges in positive terms. How can we create a solution and not turn ourselves over to the problem? And we can laugh about it and joke about it all we want, but, um, but I think um, for anyone, losing their hair is a big deal. You know, that's, that's part of your identity. And I remember my doctor telling me before, um, before I started the chemo, all right, you know, just want you to know you're going to lose your hair. It's probably going to happen in the first couple weeks. And um, it was day 13. So it was day 13. I went in for my appointment. I had not lost a hair on my head. <laughs> and I said, I think, I think I'm going to be one of those that doesn't, you know, I'm like the, the half a percent that doesn't lose their hair on this regimen. And he kind of looked at me like, okay, sweetie, <laughs> you just, I'm not, I'm not even going to say anything. <laughs> and, of course, the next day started coming out in clumps, and it is just nothing. Even if you have someone in your life that has lost their hair or gone through this, it's just you don't expect it. 
And, um, and I was very fortunate. I had a wonderful woman that I had actually interviewed as part of uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And uh, she's a two-time cancer su- survivor herself. She runs a nonprofit and, and helps women kind of get through some of these issues. And she said, Shannon, when you start losing your hair, do not, do not delay. Do not drag it out. Come in and see me. I will shave your head. We'll do a little wig party. Invite your, your close friends. And, and that's what I did. I called her up. <laughs> Help me, please. And, uh, and that's what we did. We invited you know, a few very close friends, my husband, and we just sat around laughing, and there were a fair amount of tears. And, um, and that's what you do, and, and you kind of keep moving forward from there. And um, for me, it was so important to have that support from others who had been through it, others who had helped people through it. And, and I hope to be one of those um, now that I'm kind of on the other side of it. And that support means um, everything, um, and it's important in every area of our lives. You know, we want to believe that we can do it all, and I'm a very firm believer that we can have it all. I just don't know that we don't have to do it all, at least not on the same day. It's okay to ask for help, and I think, you know, sometimes we feel like it's a weakness, especially for us type A personalities, to ask for help because we want to do it ourselves. but it's not a weakness to ask for help. In fact, there is strength in knowing when you need um, a helping hand and whether that's talking to your um, coaches or your teammates to help you out with something you're going through, whether it's um, discussing something with your parents or, or asking them to lend a hand when you're coming up on, a, on a, a big struggle. You have to be okay with asking others for help. And I'm sure many of you here in this room have helped someone. I mean, who here has helped someone through maybe a cancer diagnosis, or maybe another illness, brought over dinner, gone and done a load of laundry, sent a card, gone and done one of these walks or runs to raise money. Um, I mean, you guys are here today. All of those things add up. It's important that we understand that it is a true team effort. For me, uh, just having other survivors reach out to me and say, It's going to be okay. In fact, um, one of my first speeches uh, after chemo, I was standing up. It was um, a speech in front of Junior League, and um, a woman came up to me right before I walked up on the podium. And she said, I I just want to let you know that I had the same germ cell tumor. That was 10 years ago. I now have two beautiful children. I'm healthy, and you're going to get through this. And, of course, I broke down bawling (laughs) right before he got up and spoke. But I will never, and to this day, I probably think about that woman every single day because she was, she's me. (laughs) And I thought, okay, if she can get to the other side, then so can I. And and I'm hopeful that my story will also help others, um, help you guys to remember to think about your health because I think it's your age. A lot of us, we do feel invincible. And and that's going to carry through (laughs) into your adult life, and that's okay. But don't skip. Don't skip out on the health and wellness portion of your life. Make sure you're taking advantage of every opportunity to take control of your own health. On May 2nd of 2011, I had my last chemo treatment. Yay. Um, And I remember doctors and nurses and other survivors, they had all said, okay, you know, you're not going to feel great after your last treatment. It's going to take a while, six months, could be a year before you start feeling normal. And, um, of course, did I listen to them? No. I walked out of the doctor's office expecting the birds to sing and the clouds to part and my hair to grow back and all would be right in my world. And that didn't happen. (laughs) Um, Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. A few things in life work that way. You know, I keep mentioning that that gold medal moment was 15 years in the making and and here this was going to be the same way. It wasn't going to happen overnight. Um, My recovery was, you know, gaining a little bit of strength each day and... um, eating a little bit more food each day and, and doing all the things, taking the right steps. But again, I was back to baby steps. I was back to those short-term goals that would lead to my ultimate recovery. And of course, then there was the big question. Uh, could I still have kids? Um, that was something my husband and I were hoping for at the time. Um, I thought that I was going to be calling my parents to tell them they had another grandchild on the way. And instead, I was calling them to tell them I might have cancer. And that was, um, that was a, a difficult one 
for us, and, and all baby plans, of course, were immediately halted. So um, we remained help, hopeful, but also very thankful for the little boy that we had. And, uh, and last September, our question was answered, so now I've got my big old belly, and, <laughs> and we are expecting little one in June, and I find out the gender next week, so I'm so excited. Um, <laughs> I can't wait, because, you know, the whole idea of calling it it is getting kind of annoying. Um, so <laughs> I've kind of started trading off weeks. Like, this week it's a girl. Last week it was a boy. My three, three-year-old thinks he's getting a bear. Um, <laughs> I, he's going to be disappointed, poor thing. But, um, you know, handling pressure and adversity is about understanding the things that you can control. And for me, it came down to preparation. It came down to preparation and, and doing my best each and every day, trying to win the day every single day, no matter what life threw at me. And if I accomplished those two tasks, then there was no reason to worry because those were the things I could control and everything else you just leave up to God and, and that's how you make it through. So I transferred that mentality to my treatment and my overall diagnosis and I think for me the, the insight that I gained throughout my cancer journey um, was the realization that we all need to take control of our own health and I have become so so, I mean, I thought I was passionate about health and wellness before, and this is just up the game so much more um, because it is critical that we take care of our health at every stage in our lives. Take time for yourself so that you can recharge. Take care of the nutrition and the activity portion. Who here got eight hours of sleep last night? Yeah. <laughs> That's usually about what I get, one hand. So... I'm going to raise my hand. I got eight hours. <laughs> um, but it's important. You know, these things, they do add up over time. So think about these things. And especially, I mean, you guys as athletes, you are pushing your, yourself to the limit every single day. You've got to take care of your bodies, not just for now, not just getting, uh, you know, getting that win or getting the best score, but for the long term as well. You've got to do it. Um, cancer is such a life-altering diagnosis, and I think it's important to find um, those things that keep you positive um, throughout your treatment, uh, just like it's important to think of, uh, find ways to keep things positive no matter what challenge you're facing in your life. And there are times when you just don't think you can go on. There were times in gymnastics when I just wasn't sure I could do another routine or I could get past that injury. Don't give up. Never give up. I am very fortunate to be here today um, with you. I'm very fortunate to be able to use my voice in some small way to help others uh, to focus on their health. And I hoped that by being very public about the issue that I was going through um, would help others to see that it doesn't matter how many gold medals you have. Um, it doesn't matter who you are or where you're from. Health is health, and we have to take care of um, ourselves. We have to be our own he best health advocates. And I think many times we get so sidetracked by helping everyone else in our lives, especially as, as we get older, like I said, and, and we're thinking about you know, our parents and, and our immediate family and um, all of the things that we have to do each day. It's really important not to lose sight of taking care of our own health. So today I challenge each of you to think of a specific way, just one, think of one specific way you can do something better for your health. Maybe it is getting eight hours of sleep tonight. Maybe it's making that doctor's appointment. Um, I'm not, usually I would say maybe it's going for a 30 minute walk. I think most of you have got that covered. So, um, <laughs> so let's focus on maybe the sleep and, uh, and the good nutrition, but think of one thing that you can do each day to make your health a priority. And if you do that, uh, the way it's going to add up over time is just absolutely incredible. So my message to you today is it's okay to focus on you for a change. And when life drops you that obstacle, because I know that it will, that challenge in front of you, stick to your goals, believe in yourself, and never give up. Thank you. Shannon, thank you. Um, we have a few minutes for a few questions. Anybody? Come on, I sit in my office. I know a bunch of you have questions. I 
And for those of you that are leaving for the game, good luck. <laughs> Um, you know, it was, um, you know, difficult in some ways, but really good in other ways. It really helped me learn time management skills. It was kind of one of those things where you couldn't procrastinate. My parents made it very clear from the beginning that school comes first, education comes first, and we love that you're doing this whole Olympic thing, and that's fine, but how'd you do on your test? And so I knew if I didn't keep my grades up, I didn't get to go to the gym. So, um, so for me, it was kind of a no-brainer. I did work before school. I did homework usually during lunch. Again, I was very shy, so I was not the cool kid. <laughs> so I, you know, would be in the library doing my homework and, um, and eating with a librarian. <laughs> and, uh, and then after school, when I drove, it was about a 45-minute drive um, from my house to gym, so I'd do homework the whole way. And homework at night, and then go to bed and start all over again. And, you know, when I say it like that, it seems like it was, you know, just horrible. But it really wasn't. I don't feel like I missed out on anything um, growing up. I had a very normal childhood growing up in Oklahoma. Sister and brother had to do chores just like they did. Um, weekends, we baked cookies and went to the mall and hockey games and all that fun stuff. So I think it just created a really good balance where I just didn't procrastinate. I didn't, you know, watch a, a ton of television. I watched a little bit, but, um, but I think when you don't have something to fill that time, all of a sudden you find all these reasons that you can't get your work done. But when you have to do it, you get it done. Um, I did go to public school, so I didn't, I wasn't homeschooled. Um, so yeah, I think it just really helped me kind of learn how to be efficient with my time. This is like the quietest room I've ever been in. Yeah, <laughs> um, well, I stayed in the Olympic Village in 92. In 96, we were actually at a fraternity house on the campus of Intermary University. Um, <laughs> so we, we kind of had a separate security for, for Atlanta. Um, and it was just, it, mainly it was just easier getting into and out of our venues and our training. So that's why we did that in Atlanta. But um, in 92 in Barcelona, I stayed in the Olympic Village. And it was incredible. But I was also 15. And so it's not maybe as kind of crazy and glamorous as TV portrays it to be. <laughs> it's more like you get up and you go train. And then you come back and you take a nap and you eat and you go back to training, and you come back, and you go to bed. And so, and especially with gymnastics, because we're the first ones to compete, so we never walk in opening ceremonies. Um, not because they tell us we can't or anything like that. It's literally opening ceremonies, a lot of people don't know. You're standing out in the hot sun for like 8 to 12 hours. So, um, you know, by the time they get you there, and then you've got to stand in the back, and then you walk in, and then you've got to stand there, and then you've got to wait the, for the bus to go back. It's usually like 4 in the morning before you get back to the village. Well, we competed at, you know, 7 or 8 a.m. that day. So, so we don't really walk, walk in the opening ceremonies. Gymnastics doesn't. But, um, you know, for us, we, we just kind of crowded around the TV at the village, and we watched the opening ceremonies and went to bed, and it was, it was fun. It's it's really cool when you walk around the village and you see people from not only other countries, but all these different sports. I mean, some of these sports I had never even heard of before. I was fairly sheltered <laughs> in Oklahoma. And, um, you know, I remember sitting down one of those first days, and I had already been away from home for three weeks. And again, I'm 15, so I'm a little homesick. And I sat down, and a wrestler sat by me. He was from Oklahoma. And he's like, hey, I heard you were from Oklahoma, and he just starts talking to me, and, and we're still good friends. So it's just some of the most amazing people that you'll meet, and um, these days I think it's even better with the athletes because now they can actually communicate. They can tweet and um, cell phones, and we didn't have any of that. We didn't have, we didn't have internet <laughs> in 92, if you can imagine. So, um, so for us, it was just kind of about seeing all these other athletes and saying hi. The first people we, we saw when we walked into the village was um, the dream team. So the first time that the basketball team, um, the professionals got to play, and they were so nice. And here are these guys. I, mean, I grew up watching uh, Michael Jordan and Charles Barkley with my dad. So to walk up, and they're like, hey, you know, the gymnasts and the, the basketball players, and they signed all of our stuff and took pictures, and they were so nice. And um, it was, it's just kind of levels of playing field. No one's a celebrity. Everyone's just an athlete.
in your opinion to other other investors? I tell you what, that's a great question because that is probably one of the um, the the toughest things that um, the athletes face. Whether you're a collegiate athlete, whether you're a professional athlete, an Olympian, once you retire, what do I do with the rest of my life? You know, all my friends are here. I mean, gymnastics was my family, um, not just a sport. It's who I was. And so when you kind of quit, and it's almost cold turkey, we toured for a little bit, but then it's, you're not working out 40 hours a week, so you have the health part of that, which is, you know, you keep, I kept eating the same, six full meals a day. I mean, I would eat ribs before workout. <laughs> it was, you know, you just, and you keep eating that way, but you're not working out 40 plus hours a week. And I gained four dress sizes in about six months. And, um, you know, on a five foot frame. <laughs> so it's, you know, kind of a shock to your system. And then emotionally and psychologically, it's a bit of a shock because now you're not seeing your friends every day like you were before. And you're not part of that team environment. You're not traveling all over the world. And you really don't have any goals because you forgot to set new ones because all you've ever really focused on were the goals in, in sport. And it's kind of a tailspin. And, and we see this with a lot of athletes. And I, I was one of them. So for me, education was the key. Um, being able to go back to college, being able to go back to something that was kind of a staple in my life, that helped. Um, I had some rough years where, you know, I had to figure out, the weight and the health, and I'd never been on a treadmill before. I didn't know how to work out as a normal person. If you're a gymnast, you get on the balance beam and you get on the uneven bars. Well, I couldn't do those things anymore. So, you know, going into the like a, a real gym <laughs> where there's exercise equipment, lifting like we know we don't lift weights. Um, gymnasts, even the guys, they don't lift weights. It's all body weight. So, kind of learning how to be a normal person was was a challenge. But I think for me, it was about going through that time and finding those new goals. And once I kind of figured out um, what those new goals were, and that was a process. It was kind of like this little retreat that I did for myself. You sit down and you write down all the things that you enjoy. What are the things you enjoy doing? What are the things you enjoy that you're passionate about? What are the things you like in school? Um, what, do you th what jobs do you think would be interesting or you think you'd want to pursue or maybe intern at? And just kind of write it all down and start going through it and start thinking beyond sport, and that's kind of how I went through the process, and, and health and wellness and kids, those were kind of my big three, and so I thought, okay, well, childhood obesity, let me look into more of that, and then I found the horrifying statistics on childhood obesity and what it, you know, can do down the line. Like, okay, yes, foundation, I'm all in. Okay, now health and wellness for women, I'm a girl, I enjoy health and wellness, let's focus on that, and that kind of then took on it um, itself as no name, it kind of became its own animal. And, um, and then I was one of these kids that um, I'd always been asked to speak, horrified, horrified to stand up in front of anyone and open my mouth. And then I became a commentator for gymnastics because that was how I could stay involved with the sport. Um, you know, I, I don't feel like I was a very good coach. Um, clinician, like I'm a cleaner. I go and I clean, tweak, but just coaching from the ground up wasn't my thing. So broadcasting was the way I could keep my toe in the water in the gymnastics world without having to wear a leotard <laughs> on any given day. Um, so it's just kind of finding where you fit in, how can you kind of keep a little bit of a hold on the sport that you love. And some sports are lifetime sports. So you can still remain involved, but it's never going to be the same as it was when you're at the height of, height of your career. And you just kind of have to come to terms with that. So what I would tell you guys is do it for as long as you love it. If you love your sport, keep doing it. I don't care if anyone tells you you're too old for it. Just keep doing it. Any other questions? No? Well, then, Shannon, mm -hmm. like I said, thank you very much. Thank you.